December's CSIS She for School Dialogue discusses the impact WikiLeaks is having on public policy and journalism. CSIS's own Dr. John Hamry said that what was most remarkable about the leaks is that information revealed is consistent with what we already know about U.S. policy. Following is the full video of today's discussion. You can also see a highlight package on CSIS.org. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, I'm a little nervous tonight because I've got like four of my bosses here, Dr. Hamry, Bob Schieffer. Uh, I think there's my dad's here too, so you know, i got to be really on my best behavior. Your wife um, didn't show up. I'd like to, uh, if anybody's confused from the cold, this is not a press conference for the Rose Bowl. Uh, this is CSIS and a partnership with TCU, the Schieffer School of Journalism. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dean David Willock, the Dean of the School of Communications, who's here with us now. I'd also like to introduce the Vice Chancellor of TCU, Larry Lauer, uh, in the back. And for any of you horn Frogs who might want to connect with them uh, later. Uh, I'd also like to uh, really announce the presence of a true American hero. Uh, General Hayden is here with us tonight. I'd like to say hello to him. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, before we get started um, in this really fascinating session, I'd also like to I feel compelled to say a word. Um, this has been a sad week in Washington. Uh, Ambassador Holbrook, of course, uh, passed away last night, and we wanted to say here at CSIS that we're thinking about uh, the Holbrook family and all of his friends. I know many of you have had the occasion to work with him uh, in the past, but we're all thinking about Ambassador Holbrook. With that, I'd like to turn to my good friend Bob Schieffer and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh and uh, the Horned Frogs of TCU will be going to the Rose Bowl. Uh, they'll be playing Wisconsin, which is why I'm wearing my purple socks. <laughs> I've been wearing purple socks all season, and it's worked. <laughs> so they're two and a half point favorites, in case those of you are of a mind to bet. I think it's a really good bet. Uh, I'd also like to uh, introduce, uh, this is the first year for the Schieffer School of Journalism to have a semester in Washington. And uh, two of our uh, scholars uh, who have been here, uh, Courtney Jay and uh, Kaylee Hunter. And I think Lauren Sanders uh, is also here. She's, Lauren is the one, I think, is interning here at CSIS. So she's one of the people up uh, taking tickets at the door. Courtney and uh, Kaylee. <laughs> well, this is, this is uh, really, uh, this, this whole subject we're talking about. I can't think of anything more timely or more important. And uh, we're so happy uh, to have uh, making his first appearance as a panelist here, Dr. <laughs> Hamry, the head of Probably CSIS. Gorgeous. And you all know Dr. Hamry, uh, former Defense Department official, uh, Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, before that, uh, 10 years, he was uh, one of the professional members uh, uh, of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, a professional staffer. Uh, Karen DeYoung, my friend, longtime friend, uh, author of uh, Soldier, The Life of Colin Powell. She's an associate editor now at the uh, Washington Post, currently writes about terrorism issues uh, for the National and Foreign Desk. She's had a great career at the Post and truly one of the most respected reporters in town. And uh, I would also say the same about Scott Shane, reporter for the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, uh, covers national security. He was one of those who, I guess it's fair to say, I don't want to say you negotiated with the State Department, but when the Times got all these documents, you were the, one of the ones who went to the uh, State Department and said, we want to show you what we got here and what do you think about it. I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. Uh, he's been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize before coming to the New York Times. Uh, he was also a reporter at the, uh, at the uh, Baltimore uh, Sun, Moscow bureau chief there. Dr. Henry, I'm going to start with you as a, a former uh, defense official. <clears throat> a private first class somehow has access to 250,000 documents, many of them highly classified. How did that happen? Well, it, it was a good idea, very badly engineered. Um, you know, after 9-11, uh, we had a sense as a nation that we had information that other people needed in the government in order to uh, accomplish the, the larger task of situational awareness. So we decided to try to provide much, much broader access. That was the good idea. I mean, but the bad implementation is to not differentiate, you know, who has the need for what kind of information. And so a, a, you know, a, a corporal in the Army may have need for uh, uh, 
relevant tactical information about, uh, about terrorists or suspected terrorists in the Middle East, but would have no plausible need to know about uh, a conversation with the president of Russia about arms control. Yet we did not, in any sense, engineer access the right way. We made it broadly available because that was the easiest way to make it available. And it reflects, I think, the failings of our clearance process. It's a larger issue. It's something that we need to change. We have basically a perimeter security concept. You get into the perimeter, we give you a clearance, and then you can see anything you want. So if you drive into Washington, D.C., you can go in any home you want to go into. That makes no sense. It needs to be engineered in a different way, and we've, uh, we've got a real black eye here. I mean, it, it, it's beyond making no sense. It's absurd. It's something like well, that. Well, uh, you know, the, the challenge of government is taking ideas and engineering them practically with the constraints you have. And we have, you know, the department has a large network uh, of classified information, and the easiest thing is to simply add more to it without being, without differentiating on the side of who's reading it and do they need all of that. We just erred on the side of making far too much information available to a broad range of people, most of whom did not need it. Now, most of them don't go off this kind of voyeurism that we saw. That's not the norm. Most of our people behave quite appropriately. But we clearly had a, a, a problem individual who chose for other reasons to undertake what was little more than voyeurism. And it it is so easy now to put this material on a media and haul it out and then transmit it. But it was a very badly engineered good idea. Let, uh, let me uh, talk to you, Scott, about, so here you are at the New York Times and this stuff comes to you. Uh, what happened after that? How did you make a decision, the editors at the Times, uh, to accept it? And what did you do with it after you got it? What happened between that time and when we first began to see it show up in the New York Times? Well, there were, there, as you recall, there were three uh, uh, sort of batches of documents uh, that the Times got uh, from WikiLeaks, the first two directly, the third because uh, the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, apparently had taken offense at a profile that we would published of him. He didn't want to give us the third uh, group of documents, which were the State Department cables, uh, but the Guardian um, <laughs> which had sort of uh, agreed along with us and Der Spiegel in, in Germany, uh, ha agreed to give us the cable so that we would continue this, this sort of cooperative arrangement. So we had 250,000 cables. Um, uh, you referred to them as, as highly classified. They're not actually that highly classified by Washington standards. About 11,000, uh, if I remember correctly, of the, of the 25,000 were secret. Um, but nothing was classified higher than that. And a lot of it's unclassified, a lot of it's confidential. But uh, certainly from the State Department's point of view, an awful lot of it they, they uh, absolutely did not want out. Uh, so uh, as you can imagine that uh, you're sitting there with 250,000 documents, it's an almost impossible uh, amount of stuff to go through. Uh, so we created a, a search engine that you could, uh, you could limit by time by the embassy uh, from which the cable was sent, um, by the classification level, um, and certain other criteria. And then we just started doing searches. And you know, you tried to think of keywords and subject areas that um, might uh, be newsworthy. Uh, and you would sort of you know, plow through everything out of the embassy in Kabul, for example, in the last two years. Um, this is time-wise, this collection. How many people did you have doing this? Oh, probably all told uh, working on it. Uh, in terms of people actually reading cables, there were probably about um, 15 of us. And there were another two or three people who were uh, sort of the tech people designing the database. Um, but uh, I should say that the very earliest cable in this collection is 1966. But there's really only a handful from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and the, the, uh, the majority of it is actually from the last three years. So it's sort of, it, there's far more uh, recent. And it cuts off uh, presumably because of the circumstances by which it came so to us in February of 2010. Of you you go through that, and then you get it down to how many? 
Well, um, I mean, you know, uh, everybody kind of came up with a, a different way of, of doing this, but, you know, I, uh, for example, um, you know, one of the things we wanted to look at was, was Afghan corruption. And so, you know, my way of looking at that was to narrow it to the last few years of cables from Kabul and then use words like bribes, corruption. Um, and, you know, gradually you would, you'd, you'd find a cable and you'd copy it out into a document and you'd create a kind of collection of Afghan corruption cables and then you'd sort of use that as the base of the report. And uh, before you published them, what did you do with them? that you thought were of interest? Well, um, we, had, uh, we had a sort of elaborate arrangement to publish this uh, on, a, on a schedule, on a rough schedule by topic uh, with The Guardian, with El Pais in Spain, with uh, Le Monde in France, and with, uh, with Der Spiegel, the magazine in Germany. Um, and so we kind of had a, a rough schedule for about 10 days or two weeks of of days and subjects, uh, but we uh, also identified about 100 cables that we wanted to publish on the New York Times website, and we gave those to the State Department and said, they had them, of course, but they, we identified those 100 cables. You told them you had them. We, yeah. we told them we had them, and these are the ones that we intend to publish, and do you have, um, you know, do you, do you, uh, uh, want to participate in, in sort of advising us on what you think might be particularly damaging or dangerous if, if it's and what published. Did, what did they do? Well, I mean, their initial stance was this is stolen classified material and you shouldn't have it and we don't want you to publish any of it. Um, and that was understandable. And, um, and we said, well, we still intend to publish it. And then they, uh, they were very helpful in, in identifying stuff. Uh, that in, in many cases we'd already redacted. I mean, I'd been through a lot of the cables with, with the reporters working on the stories, and we'd taken out a lot of stuff before we sent, uh, sent them over to the What did you State take Department. out? I mean, give me an example. Well, almost uh, the vast majority of what we took out were uh, the names and identities of uh, people who'd spoken confidentially to American diplomats in what you would consider to be repressive countries. So they would be um, human rights activists or journalists or even uh, government officials or military officials. Whose lives might be. Whose dangerous. lives or, you know, probably in most cases perhaps their freedom or their careers uh, or something would be in jeopardy. Um, you know, in, in Russia, in China, in Libya, in, in any number of other places, if you uh, spoke sort of out of school to American diplomats, um, you could, you could get in a heap Did of trouble. Did you withhold any documents at the request of the State Department? We withheld uh, a couple of documents that we, you know, that news-wise we probably would have, would, they were certainly interesting, we, we would have published. We, Why? We, we didn't post them at all because, you know, there was a strong case that they would damage, uh, you know, in the case of one that I'm thinking of, uh, American, in, uh, a sensitive um, intelligence cooperation program involving another country. All right. Well, let me go now to Karen. Now, the Post did not get any of these. Uh, let me just ask you, uh, why? <laughs> um, and what would you have done if you had gotten something similar? We, like the Times, think, were told with the early releases, you know, there was the release of Afghanistan documents and, and Iraq documents, military documents earlier. And, and we were told, uh, by WikiLeaks that they, we had published something about Julian Assange that they didn't feel was um, to their liking. And uh, we were told specifically that they were not going to deal with us. Um, obviously, we knew the documents were coming. We didn't know exactly when. And so we were in the position of um, simply watching for it to drop, which it did on that Saturday afternoon uh, when the Times uh, and The Guardian and The uh, Spiegel published uh, their uh, initial accounts, w which ran on several Sundays ago. Um, and so each of them published documents along with the stories that they published, uh, often different documents. Uh, and so I think, I think, in fact, The Guardian probably posted a lot more than yep. you did. Actually, it was interesting that WikiLeaks itself was had a very strange selection of documents and still does that they've chose to publish themselves and often you will see very obscure 
things that have come up on, on their website, wherever you can find it on any given day, because obviously it moves all over the place as it gets shut down in various places. Um, so we were, we were left to uh, close to our deadline every day to, to look at the documents. Uh, and, and I did most of the stories. And what I tried to do was not look at everyone's stories about them, but to look at the documents themselves um, that, that were released across a wide spectrum of organizations and try to see what we thought was, was important in terms of stories. You know, uh, people almost immediately began to talk about this as they did about the Pentagon Papers. Of course, your paper was the one that, that uh, published the, uh, uh, the Pentagon Papers. And I noticed now that uh, Daniel Ellsberg has said that he strongly in favor uh, of this uh, uh, WikiLeaks undertaking. Uh, and he compares it to that. I'm not sure I would. Do you? Uh, no, I don't compare it to that. I mean, I think that what's amazing about these documents, at least the ones that I've seen so far, is that uh, with, with very few exceptions, um, they tend to cover issues that, that we or other media organizations have already written about right. and provide additional details that are always good to have in stories. And it's always good, obviously, to have actual words of officials as opposed to anonymous officials, which is what we usually end up quoting on these kinds of stories. Um, but I think in terms of substance, now there were some exceptions. There, were some, there was some having to do with Iran, some having to do with North Korea, and some that in the aggregate seemed to show policy going in a certain direction um, that, that actually did move the ball uh, in terms of, of what we knew. But I think by and large, uh, it was, it was, they were things that we, that we knew, that, and in fact, that we and others had written about before. Bob, can I just, yes. can I, just I mean, the, the reason the Pentagon Papers had such impact is because it was a private story that was at variance with a public right. presentation. What, we're not seeing that with this. What you're seeing here is fairly good, objective reporting by diplomats, written fairly well, that's quite consistent with the public message. So it doesn't have anything like the Pentagon Papers in terms of its meaning. Do you think, uh, you know, as a reporter, it's always hard for me to argue for government secrecy. But I do believe, in some cases, that you have to have some things uh, that remain secret. I mean, uh, I just think you do. And, and I'm, I stand second to no one in my defense of the First Amendment. I stand second to no one. Uh, in saying that there's too much government secrecy. But having said that, uh, I find this extremely troubling that something like this could happen. And, and do you think the government, uh, Dr. Hamry, acted quickly enough in getting on this uh, and, and trying to come to some understanding of how this private could somehow get a hold of all this stuff? Well, I, I, I the the dilemma of how a private could get access to this kind of information is really deeply embedded in a much larger problem. It's how we give clearances to people, the kind of information we give to them, the nature of modern communication tools. Solving this is a huge problem. It's going to take many years to fix it. And frankly, we need to get on with fixing it. I, so I, I, the, the the government responded with the immediate crisis. It now has to figure out the long-term viable solution. Do you think, Karen, this is journalism, WikiLeaks? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd, no, I'd classify it as journalism, just a sort of um, release of documents for the sake of releasing them, to, to say that you have them. I mean, WikiLeaks has described this as an effort to, to stop uh, I think they've said an immoral and illegal set of policies, but they themselves did not analyze what they thought was immoral or illegal or point out what in these documents would support that thesis. I think that um, you know it's incumbent on us to try to put things in context um, and to try to explain why it's important, uh, what preceded it, what came after it, and what was going on around it. Um, that, I think, I think is our responsibility. But I want to go back to something that John said. Um, what surprised me was even more than the fact that, that someone at a relatively low level apparently could have access to these documents in the military, but that there was no trigger 
for when there was there were downloads that had not been authorized, um, it would seem to me that that would be even easier uh, well, if you wanted to do a sort of interim. Well, but it. The, the, the problem, our security system, again, it's a perimeter security system. If you give someone a secret clearance, they can see secret material. Mm -hmm. The only way that you can constrain that is by going through a, a fairly disciplined effort about putting additional qualifiers on information. That's a hard job, and we chose not to do it. We should have, but we chose not to do it. I, now, uh, sorry, sorry, go right ahead. I was, I was just going to say there are a few things the Pentagon said it is doing that's already done. Disabling the, um, the CD and DVD write drives on, on, its, on many of its computers so that a guy like this can't just put everything on a CD as he did and walk out. Uh, that's one thing they've done. And they are supposedly experimenting with um, the kind of, you know, you get those calls from your credit card company saying, you know, this is an unusual purchase for you. Is this you? Um, it's a fraud detection mechanism. And so they're beginning to build that stuff in so that if someone, you know, suddenly downloads, right. uh, you know, uh, a thousand terabytes of information in, right. in some mean, little outpost uh, that alarm bells go off. There, so they are working there on There are something. things we can yeah. do, but yeah. it's a more complex <laughs> dimension than simply how you use a credit card. It's Tell a much me, more complex. Scott, I mean, obviously, uh, you were very responsible. The Tom Times was very responsible in how they, they went about handling this. Tell me about some of the thinking uh, that went into this and, and uh, how you decided to publish it in, in, in the first place and why you thought this was something you needed to do. Well, it's a, it is a, well, I, you say it's obvious that we were responsible. There, I think there are, there are many people who, who don't find it obvious. <laughs> well, I mean, I do hearing, hearing <laughs> your explanation. Including the U.S. State Department, but, <laughs> but uh, you're kind to say so. Uh, the, um, I mean, we still, we did, we did try to exercise judgment in terms of what we would, what we publish and what we wouldn't, both in terms of newsworthiness and in terms of, as I, as I was saying, um, you, you know, what the, what the downside would be for the government or for individuals. And I guess the three categories, there, there was that first category, which I think we tended, tended to agree with the government on, of uh, individuals in oppressive countries who could really be in, in, in deep trouble, um, whose lives might even be at stake. Um, that was probably the easiest category. Uh, the second category would be sensitive programs that, uh, that the U.S. was engaged in. Uh, and an example of, of something that, they, uh, that the government was not happy uh, that we ran, but we did end up deciding to run, was a, a cable that went out and it was one of many cables along these lines uh, that went out to embassies into the UN to say to diplomats, here are categories of intelligence information we'd like you to correct, and it got co collect. And some of it was biographical information about foreigners they were dealing with, but some of it went all the way down to uh, credit card numbers and frequent flyer numbers of, mm -hmm. uh, of foreign diplomats. And um, we knew from talking around to people uh, that there was controversy within the diplomatic corps about whether they should really be asked to, you know, you know, God knows how you do it, I guess, at the lunch table, kind of peer over and <laughs> scribble down the, the credit card number. But um, whether that was appropriate, whether it was too risky, and, and uh, whether it blurred the line too much between intelligence collection and diplomatic work. So that one we decided to run, uh, you know, over their objection. Then the third category would be where their objection was more geez, we just really would like you not to run that because it's really going to strain our relations with this guy um, or, um, you know, just make things more difficult the next time we talk to him. And in general, I have to say, we did not usually um, go along with those requests. Uh, but again, the, the majority of, the, of their requests and of, of what we agreed to were, were uh, protecting individuals. Let me just ask all three, and I'll start with you, Karen. Was there anything, uh, and there were some of these things like that uh, that were fascinating, I mean, in the same way reading other people's mail yeah. has a certain fascination. I mean, they, we're human beings. Yeah. We can't help but be interested in things we're not supposed to know about. But Karen, what, was there anything in there, and I'll ask all three of you, in these, in these uh, releases, that was the surprise that told us something we really didn't know? Because it strikes me that a lot of it, uh, we just saw background detail on a lot of things that we already knew about. 
for the most part. Well, I, I think the one that Scott just mentioned, the, the collection, the asking diplomats to collect uh, information like credit cards numbers, bank account numbers was uh, of, of people at the United Nations was, was sort of surprising. And you knew if you'd worked uh, in foreign policy for long enough that this, this had to be something that would cause a lot of consternation. Um, the same way it does with, with journalists who are asked sometimes in some places to be, to be a source of information um, in terms of damaging their credibility. I don't think in substance, you know, if, if you look at the, uh, the corruption in Afghanistan, certainly there were, there were new details. Um, there, was, there was some new information, more specifics about uh, President Karzai's brother in Kandahar. So you had, you had a, a broader and deeper sense of what it was that the Americans uh, objected to about him. I think um, uh, with Yemen, you saw um, what we had already reported that, uh, that the, the government, uh, their cooperation with the US government in terms of counterterrorism operations was, uh, was, was pretty deep. Um, you saw in the case of Yemen and in Pakistan where governments had denied uh, agreeing to these kinds of programs, but everybody and his brother had reported that they agreed to it. Uh, it, it certainly causes them difficulties at home when you see in their own words their agreement to it, not only their agreement, but their, but their, um, their uh, desire to, to, to cover it up from their own publics. So you expand your knowledge on those things. I don't, I don't think the, the, in the first instance, the fact that something hap has happened uh, or that a policy is in motion, no, I think there was very little of that. What about our family? Well, Democracy. Did you find out anything that you didn't know? No, and, and let me just say, I think very important. Democracies have to undertake, governments have to do things in secret, but democracies have <coughs> to ultimately sustain a public debate about their policies and their goals. What was remarkable here was how consistent this was. We did not see any activity being reported that was not broadly sustained by our public discourse. So I mean, but democracies do need to have the capacity to have private conversations, and I I know you think it's you know so what if they it's about making relations harder that is an important dimension, mm -hmm. and if 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 there was a broad disconnect between what we were saying as a nation to our citizens publicly and what we were saying to ourselves privately, it would be a more legitimate complaint. But the fact that it was largely consistent, hugely consistent tells me that the government does deserve a vote of confidence in being able to protect the, 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 the informal discourse of diplomacy. Do you think there is any serious damage that's been done? Well, I, you know, this big Brzezinski here says, you know, this is like, I think Metternich once said, well, this is catastrophic, but not serious. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> the, you know, this is really bad. I mean, uh, ultimately, do, I don't believe it's going to, because it, it testifies to the integrity of our diplomacy, in my view. But it is very difficult for our diplomats to have the next conversation and the next conversation with people. And I think we're going to find uh, foreign interlocutors that are going to be less forthcoming, and we're going to find our own diplomats less forthcoming in how they convey things. And I think this is going to be a, a detriment. Any real news? I mean, you know, I, th I think I would agree that there, there were no huge scoops, which is sort of what you'd expect given the secret, secret and below classification level. And, uh, but I think, you know, in a way, in a democracy, <clears throat> it's newsworthy that what the diplomats are saying is not at odds mm -hmm. with what we generally understand our foreign policy to be. And, you know, while while undoubtedly there are some relations that are strained, you know, this is, this is sort of a scattershot thing. And, you know, you could all, all you, very quickly you saw Secretary of State Clinton and others using these revelations to the advantage of the United States. For example, there were a number of uh, leaders in the Arab world who were outed as being extremely fearful and ex outspoken against the notion of Iran having nuclear weapons. <clears throat> that is not a huge surprise, but it's something they tend not to, uh, to say publicly and certainly not to stay, say, uh, as King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia said, you know, you, 
you must cut off the head of the snake. Uh, and uh, Secretary Clinton very quickly, while deploring the leaks and, and talking about the damage it could cause, also began to say, geez, you know, it's interesting to see we're not alone. We in Israel are not alone in, in, in being fearful about this. Um, and one other thing I should say is that I think diplomats, many diplomats, including some I talked to, were very distressed at this and thought it would make their jobs harder. There was a sort of undercurrent of pride in uh, what I think many people that I spoke with were impressed with the general quality of, of their work, the quality of their writing and their reporting. And, um, you know, one of my favorite cables was something I stumbled across early on that I think kind of became a little bit of a hit. I know NPR read part of it. And it was a report by a diplomat from the embassy in Moscow uh, on a wedding in Dagestan in the Caucasus. Just a wild, uh, uh, thoroughly reported and extremely entertaining account uh, that's not momentous in the, in the kind of annals of diplomacy or, or statecraft, but you know, is certainly doing a service in trying to tell Washington, you know, here's part of Russia. It's a volatile part of Russia. You know, the, the, the dictator of Chechnya came to the wedding with his entourage and supposedly left a, 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 a five kilogram lump of gold as his, his wedding present. And, uh, and, you know, just a wild scene and, uh, and a wonderful piece of reporting. So I think, you know, it did show that, that uh, a lot of diplomats have a lot to be proud of. Let me ask uh, all of you. Uh, and then uh, those of you in the audience, we certainly want to take your questions. You have some, so uh, while we're going, making this final round, be thinking of your uh, question. What do you make, uh, Karen, and I'll ask all of you this, of this uh, so-called anonymous group that sprung up to sort of uh, take on the people who, who took on WikiLeaks, like PayPal, that closed their account, and Amazon, and, and so forth? Uh, should we all be... Uh, shaking in our boots here that these people might be going after all of us here if you say a, an ugly word about uh, WikiLeaks or something? I think, it's, I think it's, it's distressing. I think it's kind of sad that, uh, and, and it's a reflection of, I think, what's some of the worst of the, of the internet and, and social networking, that it uh, simply throws things up against the wall like spaghetti to see, to see what, what will stick. And, and I don't, I don't want to say that the, the, the mainstream media or lamestream media or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, has a, has a, um, you know, an inside, should have an inside um, uh, avenue into, into all that's good and, and worth talking about. But I do think that um, there is, there's a responsibility to, to look at what's done with information and information in and of itself is, is not worth all that much unless you have a context to put it in, unless you have some understanding of why it's important. And I guess, personally, it's a sort of my, to the extent I have a problem with it, and, and as a journalist, there are many ways in which I don't have a problem with it, but, but to the extent I do, it is this sort of, um, um, going back to what I said before, you know, uh, we are attacking the immoral and the illegal uh, about what the United States is doing without being able to articulate exactly what that is. And so uh, w to the extent that people jump up and say everything should be public all the time, um, I think that that both personally for people in this country and in terms of the government is, is problematic. Well, I, we've got three issues that are kind of frequent conflated, and fortunately we've not done that here, but one is, uh, you know, a flawed government employee who acted independently in violation of his pledge, and a government that engineered very poorly a security system. That's the first. Second are these cyber anarchists that do not have a rationale other than a, 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 just a c capacity to create chaos. And then we have the story of responsible journalists struggling with information bridging across the two. I, to me, it it, it's why I'm so worried about the collapse of professional journalism, uh, because we've had the discipline of editorial restrict, uh, observation that has given us a sense of what is and is not news. Uh, we're contrasting here what cyber anarchists are putting out for the world to see and what responsible journalists are struggling to manage. We may not like it. I frankly don't like anything about this. but. 
I respect the fact that you've wrestled with it and you did a very responsible job within the boundaries of how you saw your duties. I really do respect that. We're going to deeply regret losing that as being the foundation of journalism. And that's what's in front of us is a world of these cyber anarchists. What is ground truth in cyberspace now? And that's a problem. Well, one of the most interesting things to me um, in this whole episode, and something that's sometimes gotten lost in the reporting, um, you often heard on the radio or TV, WikiLeaks, the organization that released 250,000 dip secret diplomatic cables. Um, in a limited sense, that's true. They l released them actually initially to <clears throat> a number of European publications. As far as we know, they got these, uh, you know, just. I don't know, I don't have any inside knowledge, but it appears they got them in May or June. They could have, you know, if they were really living up to the cyber anarchist creed that everything should be public all the time, they could have, uh, in, in, in an instant, dumped 250,000 unredacted cables online. And it would have been, um, you, you know, much more of a tidal wave of information. Whether people would have really been able to make their way through it, who knows. But either either because they felt burned over the Afghanistan documents, where they took a lot of heat for failing to redact out some names of Afghan informants who uh, were presumably put in danger. Uh, they, they retreated. With the Iraq document dump, they actually ended up uh, redacting with computers and stripping names out of them. And their, the documents they put up were more severely redacted than the ones we put up. And with this, uh, with this cache of documents, they basically uh, have been mostly in lockstep with these publications. And I have been part of a, a kind of bizarre process where when we redacted documents, we were sending them back to WikiLeaks. And they were posting them in redacted form. And they were actually trying, they were saying sometimes, uh, you know, El Pais has redacted this document this way, and you redacted that way, and you know. And they were taking some care. And these are anonymous people. I have no idea who these people well, are. Well, let me just ask you right but, but I was, And I was just going to say, they have only released. This is a little known fact. It's kind of lost. WikiLeaks has about somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, 1,500 documents up on its website now out of these 250,000. So they're not even at 1% yet. And what's going to happen from here on out, who knows? But the cyber anarchists have sort of realized that some restraint is necessary, it, it appears. Well, do you know who these people are? I mean, other than uh, Asajj, uh, do, does anybody know who they are? Where do they operate from? Do they have an office? Uh, I mean, maybe this is public, but I don't know. I mean, I, I know very little about them. I mean, it's a bunch of volunteers in a number of countries. Um, Assange has been reported to be with uh, some, some of his associates in, outside London in recent times. Uh, he's been in Sweden at other times. I mean, they're sort of a virtual group. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard some names, I've known some names, there have been people, it, you know, it's, it's like the PTA or something, people drop out, uh, they get disgruntled and they leave, there's a guy who left and has started something called Open Leaks now. So it's not exactly a, um, a uh, you know, a stable organization uh, like CSIS, you know, with an address. But I mean, they don't, you know, I mean, you know. There's some similarities, though. Right? <laughs> Despite if, the overwhelming similarities. You don't know where they are, basically. I mean, you know there's some people out there, and they're They're, all they're very hard to, you know, I have yeah. one email address for a guy, you know, but it's, they're very hard to uh, contact. I think there's some in Iceland. There's a, yeah. A, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the girl with the uh, dragon tattoo. I mean, <laughs> Clearly. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Has anybody got a question here that they step right up, Lloyd? <clears throat> With your permission, three related uh, questions. One, did any of the publications uh, pay uh, WikiLeaks uh, for any of the material? Secondly, um, Let, let's just, just answer. Let's oh, just all right. Say, and all right. Is that true? Well, Do you know, uh, to my knowledge, the answer is no. Uh, I don't think any of the ones we've been dealing with have paid. There was there was the Wall Street Journal, I believe, reported that they were once offered a deal where if they broke an embargo on the documents, they would have to pay WikiLeaks $100,000, and they refused to enter into it. It wasn't exactly an upfront payment, but it was some kind of scheme where they'd pay if they published the documents before a, a particular date. But that was never, I don't think, part of our deal. And so we've never entered into any kind of uh, you know, uh, monetary agreement with WikiLeaks. Right. Second question. Let me ask these two parts, and then you can answer them. One is that setting aside the legal niceties, 
is the, if the gravamen of the offense of espionage and treason is the damage to the country, is the country damaged any less by someone who steals classified document and sells it to a foreign government um, in, in contrast to someone who acquires known stolen classified documents and makes it available to all foreign governments. And the second question is, what, what is the rationale, do you think, whereby um, someone substitute his or her judgment for an official who determines that a document should be classified? Dr. Hammer, you want to well, take let shot me, at that? Let, let me try to strike a balance here without being a partisan. Uh, no, I mean, a, a, any release of classified is damaging, but so too is it damaging for us to have a debate that tears at the consensus of American society. Uh, Americans want their, you know, everybody that came here wanted to leave where they were, you know, and, and they were nervous about the government, so every American's got a genetic disposition towards wanting to be protected by the government and to be protected from the government. And it's, this is that delicate balance where we, we have to strike it all the time. I personally think this was quite damaging, and, and I deeply regret it. I also think that if we were to try to you know, shut down the New York Times over something like this, it would be far more damaging in American society. This is one of these painful things we go through all the time. And we have to basically rely on the professionalism of very good journalists and responsible companies to work with us at times like this. I, I would just say, as a journalist, I think there are times when a journalist uh, uh, puts his judgment ahead of that of someone in the government. Just because somebody's in the government doesn't mean that doesn't automatically wisdom doesn't automatically accrue uh, with the with a title uh, as a government official. And I think uh, there's a question when it comes to it when you have caught the government in an absolute lie and it's a significant lie, and and you're able to uh, show that it's a lie. Uh, then I think a, a journalist is justified in, in, uh, in, in publishing that. And uh, I mean, I think that's kind of what American journalism is all about. Even because, if it involves uh, classified documents. Well, sometimes documents are classified for no other reason that they might not be true. Anybody who's been in Washington knows and, and understands that. But I'm just saying you're asking for a justification. Uh, that would be uh, one of the justifications uh, that I would cite. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if people didn't make those judgments, the whole idea that whistleblowers, people of that nature, uh, I think there's a lot of good come from, uh, from whistleblowers uh, from time to time. But I think there are times. But when responsible news organizations make a decision to do that, they don't do it just off the top, oh, let's just do that. It'll be a lot of fun. They give it a lot of thought, just like the New York Times has done, just like CBS News has done in, in times past. It's, you know, it's responsibility. And that's the part that a lot of people in mainstream journalism wonder where the responsibility was uh, in WikiLeaks in making the decision that they did. But, Karen. but I, w I would ask if you draw a distinction between uh, information that is not passed through a document, information that's passed in conversations that we have every day of the week um, that, that, that could be considered classified, or, or does it have to be just something in a document? I mean, I think, you know, it's pretty well established law that, that um, the First Amendment means that if we know something that we have the option of, of publishing it, um, you have the option uh, as a citizen of saying, this is garbage and you shouldn't be allowed to do this, uh, and, then, and then trying to take action to stop it. But I think our responsibility is, whether it's through conversations um, or, or looking at documents that we don't publish, which we do all the time, uh, or, or somebody actually handing you a document, which is, is actually I mean, this was a kind of massive handover of documents, but, but the fact is that very little of what I do, and I would guess what, what Scott does too, is, is having someone just hand you a document. That just doesn't, that's, that's a very rare experience, relatively. Um, One other thing about 
about classified documents, however, is anyone who's wallowed around in, in declassified documents or filed a Freedom of Information Act request and gotten documents that were previously classified delivered to them. Um, I mean, there are sort of semi-famous examples, some of them you can find on the web, and most of us who've been doing this for a while have seen them, where a document through oversight uh, or being, being asked for from two different uh, organizations, agencies, uh, redacts it twice. You know, once it's redacted in 1990 and once it's redacted in 1995 by a different agency. And the first agency figures the top half of the page is very sensitive and blacks it out. And the second agency thinks actually the bottom half of the page is very sensitive and blacks it out. And you get both of them. And, you know, and it just shows that what, <clears throat> what should be classified and at what level is, is a very subjective process. And one other uh, small point is, uh, you know, and this is a fairly extreme example, obviously, but I spent a few years living in the Soviet Union. And they used to have uh, an agency called Glavlit, which uh, was essentially the official censorship agency. And they had a big, thick book of everything that was banned. And uh, government had sort of the upper hand in that society. So the, you know, the fisheries ministry put in there that, uh, if, you know, that dumping fish uh, into the ocean waste you know, was a state secret. And pretty much everything got to be a state secret after a while. So there's, you know, and when you ask, should the bureaucrat have the, have the last word on what's classified or should a journalist? And why, you know, many people have asked, why, why, is a, why are journalists appointing themselves as the arbiter of what should be secret? <clears throat> well, you know, I, you know, we are imperfect at it, but so is the government. And I think it's in this sort of interplay and this tension that exists in, in the way we run our society that, you know, generally we sort of muddle along and, uh, fairly decently. I would just add one thing, and then we'll go on to something else. I mean, far too much information is classified. Mm -hmm. And because something is embarrassing to the government is not a legitimate reason to classify it. It just isn't. And, and the problem with all of that is that once it gets classified, getting it unclassified, mm -hmm. even things that shouldn't be classified, takes literally years. And I'll never forget, I was telling Dr. Hamry before this panel, one of the my favorite stories that I ever did at CBS News is, is years ago during the Pentagon Papers. Uh, I was the Pentagon correspondent. And one, one day, I went down to the Pentagon bookstore, which is down in, in, in the basement of the Pentagon, and discovered that they were selling the Pentagon Papers. If you all remember, they had bound them as books. And they were selling them down there. And people were lined up to buy them. And I took a camera crew down there and took pictures of it and did the story because what made it was the story was because upstairs they were still classified and they were still locked away in safes. And I'll never forget uh, that evening after the news, Walter Cronkite called me and he said, Bob, if you hadn't have taken pictures of that, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> but that's the mess you get in with, with all this classification. But I, I, and Dr. Hamry knows I this. Agree. I think just, just briefly along those same lines, there's a, there's a controversy going on now where the Congressional Research Service, uh, people who work there who are charged to come up with reports for Congress on, on whatever subject Congress wants, have been told that they cannot uh, access any of these documents, which are on every website in the world, yeah. uh, to, to inform them as they, as they write their reports. They cannot refer to any information that's in any of them in their reports to Congress. Uh, presumably they can go home and turn on their home computer and, and have full access to it, but then they can't acknowledge in their reports that they've had access to it. So it's, it, it is a, a pretty confusing and sometimes ridiculous system right. in a lot of Anybody ways. Anybody else have a question here? Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm Harlan Ullman. Uh, aside from the embarrassment, it seems to me there are going to be two very likely consequences. The first has to do with freedom of speech and the First Amendment. And the second, combining what John calls uh, uh, these anarchist cyber people with something like Stuxnet. In the first case, as you may or may not know, Julian Assange has hired a top-notch British attorney. And that's going to be a very interesting court case. So I wonder how you come out with this issue about consequences for the First Amendment. And secondly, what happens when this is not information leaking, but something along the lines of real damage the uh, Estonian cyber attacks or the Stuxnet attacks into Iran, where you may have thousands of fellow travelers who are anxious to jump on and support that? Well, I, I think 
a very valid issue, but I think it's a different issue. And, and uh, we, we do not, as organized society, know how to deal with, uh, with this powerful communication tool that's grown up to be so hugely ubiquitous and open and that we've made ourselves so dependent on. And so it now, we have huge vulnerabilities associated with this. And yet we don't know how to shut it off because we depend on it every day. And so we're frankly just stumbling our way through this. I, I, I personally don't think that there is an ultimate solution to this problem because clever people will always find ways to tear apart uh, computer software. So, you know, we use we have kind of a physical model for cybersecurity, which is kind of like you got a fence around your yard, you got a gate at the driveway, you got motion detectors, you got double locks on the doors. I think, in, in, and I think that's inappropriate for cyberspace. I think we should think of cyberspace is, is like how do doctors stay healthy working in hospitals full of sick people? Because that's what cyberspace is going to be. It, this is going to be a polluted dangerous environment and you've got to stay as well as you possibly can. So it's more about nutrition, it's more about exercise, it's about sleep, it's about having you know, the capacity to recover quickly. You're going to get sick and it's about recovering once you get sick because there's just not going to be possible to stay pristine in this environment. It's too ubiquitous a problem now. All right. Well, on that note, thank you all for coming for the Schieffert School of Journalism. Happy holidays. Thanks very much. That was really good. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. That was just great. Thank, Thank you. you. Scott, that was really good. That was terrific. Thanks yeah, so much. I really appreciate it.